Hi everyone. In this video, I'll show you how to conduct modular arithmetic using Python. The packages we will use include datetime and pytz. Let's start with defining what modular arithmetic is, which is the process where the modulo operation returns the remainder when dividing. The equation below outlines the operation. The numbers within the operation go up to b, which is known as the modulus, which sets the range of outputs. Here we have the equation a, which is the number being divided, or the dividend, divided by b, which is the divisor, and the modulus. And the result will output a quotient, q, which is the number of times that b can go into a. We'll also have a remainder, which is going to be the leftover number. This will make more sense, I think, once we actually go through an example. Now let's review how we can conduct modular arithmetic within Python. And we do this using the percentage sign symbol. This is a built-in modulo expression that works on both integers and floating numbers. In this video, just for simplicity, we'll focus only on integers. You can also use different functions from packages, such as fmod, to conduct modulo operations. There are differences between the different functions, and I, if you want to learn more about them, I recommend you go to the sources here on the differences between the two. Let's move on to actually conducting a modulo operation. Our first example, we have 6 modulo 2, or 6 mod 2. The result of the modulo operation is 0. And to explain how this works, we have 6, and we divide it by 2, and that's equal to 6, and we know that 2 can go into 6 3 times. So we have 2 times 3, which is 6, minus 6 is going to get 0. We have a quotient, or the number of times that 2 can go into 3, 2 can go into 6, which is 3, and a remainder of 0. Our second example is when we have a number that, or a divisor that doesn't go evenly into the, the dividend. In this case, we have 5 mod 2 is equal to 1. And to explain how this works, we have 5 divided by 2. We can do 5 minus 2 times 2, which is 4. And when we subtract 5 minus 4, we have a remainder of 1. So in this case, 2 can go into 5 twice, and once it does that, we'll also have a remainder of 1. We can also check this by using the modulo function within Python, and I'll use that now, and I'll also print out the results. And we can see that our results that we were able to compute here match up with the Python output where 6 modulo 2 is equal to 0, and 5 modulo 2 is equal to 1. We can also take a look how these divide into each other. Again, we have this laid out here, but we can take a quick look just to get a better understanding. 6 divided by 2, that goes into it 3 times. And for 5, we have 5 divided by 2. We have a quotient of 2, but then we have this leftover. And it should make... it should be clear now how this works, but if it doesn't, I highly recommend you play with a few other numbers just to get a better idea of how this operation works. We can also create a modulo function from scratch, and the way that we can do this is we can use a division operator known as floor division, and this is another built-in math expression within Python. Instead of returning the remainder, what floor division does is it returns the quotient, or the whole number, that goes into the dividend. Now let's start building out our function. The first thing that we need to do is we need to write out def to let Python know that we're creating a function, modulo. And we'll take in two numbers. I'll call this the divisor. And then I'll call this the modulus, or the number of times it goes around. I'll just call it mod. Then what we'll do is we are going to return the divisor and we're going to subtract it by the divisor and we do modulo the modulus and multiply it by the modulus as well. And let's take a look at how that will work. So what I'll do is I'll just put 
I'll do, we'll take a look at five modulo two again. In this case, what we'll do is we're going to take five and we're going to use floor division and we get a quotient of two. And that makes sense because that's what we had here as our quotient. Next, what we have to do is we need to multiply by the modulus. In this case, we multiply by two and we have that four. Then finally, we're going to take this all and we're going to subtract it by the divisor or five. And this will return the modulus. And we, we have an identity that can prove this out. I'll include a link in the resources that explains this more in depth. But this is how we get our modulus fun modulo function from scratch. Run this. And what we could do is we can, first of all, check our first two examples to make sure it works. Again, for the function, it's going to take the divisor, which is going to be six and five, and then our modulus or dividend is going to be two for both of these. They should be zero and one respectively. Let's check out if our function works. Great, it was able to print out the correct output for the modulus operation. What we could do is we can also check against a multiple numbers. What I'll do is I am going to print out a nested for loop and I am going to go over a certain range, let's say negative 10 to 10. And these are all going to be integers. So going up, going from negative 10 up to, but not including 10. And then I'm also going to have a modulus. I'll actually call this divisor. And I'll call this, well, I'll call this div. And I'll call this modulus. What we're going to do in this loop is we're going to print out the divisor, the modulus, then we're going to run them through our function, which is the modulo function. And we're going to check that it is equal to Python's modulus function is equal to the function that we created. Let's run this. Great. And if we went through all this, they should all match up. And if there was a false, then that means that there'd be an issue with our function but it looks like we were able to create this correctly. And then we can just spot check this by going the, over the numbers are in our head. Nine modulus nine, that should equal zero because nine goes into nine once and there's a remainder of zero. Nine modulo eight, that should be one because eight goes into nine once and then there's a remainder of one. Same thing for all of the other numbers which seem to match up. Then for our final function that we're going to create is we're actually going to code out a clock using modular arithmetic. And what we'll do is we're going to program this clock to return an hour in military time. And for military time, we have it listed out here. It goes from zero up to 2300. Once it hits, goes past 2300, it doesn't go to 2400, it goes to zero 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 which is the way it's stylized and it keeps wrapping around the modulo is going to be 24 in this case and we'll see how this works what we'll do is we're not going to focus on the minutes we're just going to focus on the hour what we're going to program is we want it to return either the current time or the future time we can also program out the specific time zone if you want to see time zones based in different parts such as Asia or Africa. Now let's start with writing our function. The first thing that I'm going to do is I am going to create our function, call it clock, and I'm actually going to put two defaults. What I want to do is I want to, we're going to add or subtract the current time, add or subtract to the current time. And I'll explain that as we get more into the code, but the default hour is going to be zero. We're also going to put in a time zone. And for the time zone I'll use as the default is Eastern Standard Time. 
you can set the default to wherever you live. I'll review the different options you have there. The first thing that we need to define in our function is going to be a variable called current time. And that is going to use the date time function as well as the pi tz function. And what I'm going to do is I am going to get the date time to get the time now, but I also want to get it for a specific time zone. Otherwise it will return universal time, which I don't think many people use personally. And the way that we're going to get the time zone is we're going to use the pi tz time zone. And I have my, TZ, my time zone already defined, which is Eastern Standard Time. Then what I want to do is we can get day, month, hour, minute. I want to get the hour because that's what we're going to be running our modulus arithmetic on. Next is I'll call a variable called updated time. And this variable is going to take the current time and then it's going to add the hour that we put in there. And we're going to do this modulo 24 because again, if we have this military time, it goes from zero up to 2300. Once it hits 2400, it resets to zero. And we'll see different examples of this, but if we just take a look at this quickly, if we do 2100, if the time is 2100 right now, and we want to get the time five hours from now, it won't be 2500, it will be 0, 100, because it will go past the modulus of 24. And that's what we'll do. So we'll take a look at that once we get into it. Then we have our updated time. We also want to take a look at the minutes. And the way that we'll do that is we're just going to take this date time, paste it here, and we're going to change this to minute. And we won't change that. We'll just add that into our string value. Now that we have the times and we can project the time forward or backward, or we can just get the current time by leaving the default hour at zero, we also want to stylize it in this military time, time format. And we'll do that by converting the numbers into strings. And we can see that for zero, at 3 a.m. it's 0, 0300. If we go out to 9 p.m. standard time, the way it's stylized for military time is 2100. We'll do some format, we'll change the integers here into strings. And the way that, that we'll do that is if the length of the string in minutes is less than one. So meaning that the minutes are less than 10, it's zero nine. We still want the zero in there and we'll say equal to one. Then we want to run this if else statement. And if the minutes are equal to one, we're going to set minutes equal to and we're going to add a zero to the front. We're going to concatenate and we're going to turn the string, the minutes into string and we're going to override it. Else, what we'll do is we'll just turn minutes into string format. So str minutes, because this will all be double digits. This will be 10 minutes up to 59 minutes. We'll do the same thing for the hour. And we'll say that if the length of the updated time, which is going to be the hour, is equal to one, meaning that the time goes from zero hundred up to zero, up to zero nine hundred, we want to put the zero in front of it. What we'll do is Similarly, we'll concatenate it and we'll do print. And we'll also put in our else statement in case that the time is already past 0, 0900 onto 1000 up to 2300. And you'll also notice that in this function, we're just going to print this out. We're actually not going to return anything, but that's fine. This is just met 
to be a learning and doesn't really need to output specific data that we need to work with. Okay, let's run this function and let's try it out. What I'll do is I'll run it and we already have our defaults in there. So I don't have to define anything. I could just run this. I could just say, I want the current time, which is the hour is equal to zero. And I want it for Eastern standard time. Meaning I could leave the parameters unfilled because they're already filled by default. Let's run this. Great. And we have our military time. So currently it is 2320 in military in Eastern standard time. And what I could do is if I want to project an hour from now, this is going to be 23. And I'm going to do one hour. And what this will be is it will be 24 modulo 24. And we know from previous examples that this will return zero. Let's check if our clock is going to return that. So it should return zero hundred and it will still give us the 20 minutes because we're just incrementing by hours. We're not incrementing by minutes. And let's run this. Great. So one hour from now in Eastern Standard Time, it will be 0 20, 0 0121. We can also go backwards as well. We can put negative one. So we want to know what the previous time was an hour before from now. And it was 2221. And what we could also do is if you are in a different time zone, we can check that out as well. I'll still keep it to the current hour and I'll put zero. And let's say that I want to get the current time for Addis Ababa. And I have to state that TZ is equal to Addis Ababa. Let's run that. And currently it is 0722 over in Addis Ababa. And if you want to get the time zones specific to where you are, you can check out the list of time zones provided by PyTZ. And there's a function called all time zones. It's actually returns a list of time zones. Let's run this. And you can find the specific location you are if you want to try this out wherever you are. I hope that this video was helpful. And before I leave it off, I am also going to just review a few real world applications of modular arithmetic. And it's very useful in cryptographic applications such as the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which utilizes modular arithmetic. Diffie-Hellman specifically allows two parties to securely exchange cryptographic keys over a public channel. This is just one example of modular arithmetic within cryptography. It's very popular in the field. And previous videos I made util utilize modular arithmetic in the cryptographic videos. Modular arithmetic can also be used to track inventory within systems. UPC codes or barcodes on items such as cereal boxes and soup cans can help grocery stores track the items in a store. There are 10 digits that comprise a UPC that are used to track it. And there's a checksum that uses modular arithmetic to verify that the UPCs are valid. I included a source here by Professor Ruth Berger that goes into this in detail. Very similar, another real world process that uses modular arithmetic is the International Standard Book Number or ISBN. And this is used to verify books and there are unique values that are made using modular arithmetic. Again, you can check out this article by Professor Ruth Berger that goes in depth on how that's done. Thank you everybody for watching. I've listed a bunch of different resources that I've used and that you can also check out in order to go more in depth into modular arithmetic. It's very useful in real world applications. And again, this article by Ruth Berger goes over almost a dozen applications where modular arithmetic is used. Here are a few websites that go into it into detail. I also included 
Python resources in case you want to check out the differences in how modular arithmetic is done. And you can even see how other languages tackle it, like C versus Python. Thanks again for watching. If you like the video, feel free to like and subscribe. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and GitHub. Thank you everybody for watching and happy coding.